Welcome. I'm Kinetic Symphony. I hunt down and report on mysterious and weird true stories, from glitches to the paranormal. This is my channel's weekly compendium, ending Monday, August 15th, 2022. Case file number 720, written by Nine Tails. The Monster Electrician. This seriously happened to me last year. I was home alone. My two older brothers are always in our local church, which is just very near to us. It's like one street away. We also had no electricity. It was daytime, so we couldn't pay our bill on time. I was home alone. I'll have to admit I'm not in the church with my brothers because I'm too lazy when it comes to religions and things that need me to go out and talk to people. I would always choose to be home alone, back then. So yeah, I was home alone, no electricity, just using my phone, drawing stuff on my sketchbook, music, etc. My brother came home and he went straight to the bedroom, no word or anything at all. But it wasn't very fast, he walked very normally with a normal face. After a couple of hours, it was almost night time. We do have candles, but I couldn't find them, so I asked my brother, who still hasn't come out of his bedroom. He came out quickly and went outside to the house after he told me to follow him and fix the electricity. I was like, what's your plan? And he asked me to go get the screwdriver and pliers. He taught me how to get electricity back when it's cut off. He told me to cut this hanging thing. It was a lock for this electricity meter. It's a circle shaped thing that's attached to a wall in every house that has electricity. He told me to remove the seal after the lock and pulled out the whole cover. This revealed a plastic chip that was in between this metal that's supposed to be in contact with the cover I just removed. So I removed that chip and put back the cover and the lights went on and I was like, oh wow, that's it? That was easy. Then my brother went straight back to the bedroom again. I received a call on my phone. We're going to spend the night here. You should come over. We got electricity and food here. My brother said that. The one who's speaking on the phone, of course I know his voice, I know my brother's voice. This voice, the one who just helped me fix our electricity here. I asked him, where are you? He told me he's in the church. I said, stop, you're obviously joking, you're so lame. But I wanted to come over to his bedroom just to throw a pillow on him, but I realized I'm not even hearing any voice from his bedroom while I'm talking to him. He was talking normally. He was not being quiet. I could hear him inside, but there was no voice at all. I couldn't run. My legs turned so weak. I didn't even want to make any sounds at all. I slowly, slow as a nail, grabbed my pants and slowly walked out, while looking at every single corner. I was tearing up so bad, my lips were shaking while I was thinking, if this is a prank, god damn, I'm such a piece of cake. But it was not. It was not a prank. I arrived at the church trembling, even crying the worst when I saw both of my brothers. They had never ever seen me cry like that before. I'm even crying while typing this out. It has got to be the most traumatic memory of my life because it's so inexplicable. I was with someone who was surely not human. That was not my brother. I talked to him. I followed his orders to fix our electricity. I freaking followed a non-human's command. Case notes for file 720, the monster electrician. So the first thing that popped into my mind was actually Fight Club, the movie. Now spoilers, but if you haven't seen it yet, come on, what are you doing? Go watch it. Where Tyler Durden was projecting a version of himself into the world as a hallucination. He was a split personality that was manifesting in the world, not really, but just in his mind. He wasn't aware that he was the one responsible for the, all the events of the film. Now, I don't think this exactly fits for this glitch. I don't think that was you, the doppelganger, or just where my mind went. Because yeah, you certainly don't have that knowledge buried deep in your subconscious, or it would be a bit odd if you did. And I also agree it couldn't really be a prank because your, well, your brother, quote unquote, was in his room. And you would have heard him talking in the room, unless the room is soundproof, but given your description, it doesn't sound like it because you heard him just shuffling around in there. He was physically in there, but it wasn't him. So if that is a prank somehow, I don't know how, given he also was at the church, 
when you went there later on. So I guess it's a doppelganger. It seems to be the most likely answer. Now, sometimes people try to explain doppelganger sightings as autoscopy, which is a medical slash psychological condition where you see yourself outside your body. Not as a near-death event, but just seeing yourself outside your body from a different angle or perspective. And then you can see a double of yourself because it's just you seeing yourself. So people don't interact with themselves in these hallucinations or episodes. So given that, the only angle now is that, yeah, indeed, your brother was being impersonated by some entity. Now, when these events happen, I always question, what is the motive? If there's another entity involved, why would they be doing what they're doing? In any crime scenario, the very first thing investigators ask is, what was the motive? It seems reasonable that in these mysteries, we should ask ourselves the same thing. What is the motive of these entities? They're not just pure chaos, maybe a poltergeist, but outside of that. What purpose would an entity have to help you restore electricity in your home? How does that help them? Perhaps it's a guardian angel. It's a bit trivial though it seems, right? For such an event, just restoring electricity? Why would they bother? Maybe you need electricity for some challenge in the future. Maybe you just need to be prepared for it, and you needed electricity for that. Creepy file number 40, written by Mega Weeb, the Disney World Predator. In Orlando, Florida, I was staying at a resort in Disney World. I was sitting outside on the steps of the courtyard, and a man approached me. We were the only two people in the vicinity. The man did not look like a resort guest. I stood up and he began to talk to me. He asked me what my name was, and me being on the spot, I stupidly told him. He smiled creepily. He asked how long I was staying there. I told him I didn't know. He continued on to talk to me, making me more and more uncomfortable. I just wanted to go back to my room and hide. I wasn't giving him any detailed answers when responding to his questions, but when I'm on the spot like that and someone I don't know asks me a question, I answer somewhat truthfully. I really don't want to answer truthfully, but it just comes out. I'd say it's probably due to anxiety. I wish I wasn't so honest to random people. It's dangerous. If I were to hightail out of there, he probably would have been able to catch me. The man had graying hair. He was tall and muscular. He did not look attractive at all. His questions kept getting weirder, like, Are your parents here? And, What room are you staying in? Dusk began to fall. So many red flags. I'm quite a shy person with people I don't know anything about. I tend to give them one-word answers if they ask me any questions. At this point, I wanted to leave very badly. The man got real close and stared into my eyes, making me even more afraid. He was close enough to grab me. Just then, the door leading to the courtyard opened. I feel scared now. I turned, expecting to see one of the man's friends, but in fact it was the opposite. It was my amazing great uncle. Out of all the people staying at the resort, my great uncle came out of that door. I was saved. The man smiled at him, an unsettling smile. My great uncle knew something was up, and so he told me that my parents needed me for something, and that I should come with him, and so I did. My uncle held out his hand, and I took it, walking past the creepy man. I shivered as I noticed his eyes following me. My great uncle asked if I was okay. I told him I was a bit scared. My great uncle asked who that man was. I told him I didn't know. We were headed to my grandma's room, through the vast courtyard. We walked hand in hand on the sidewalk that led to more of the rooms. I kept looking over my shoulder. The man was still standing at the steps, looking at me and smiling. I believe that my uncle knew what the man's intentions were, as did I. The man was probably falling for me. In other words, he possibly was a diddler. I am so grateful that my uncle was there to save me. This happened on my winter break. I was 17 and I still am. I still think about what happened to this day and shiver at the thought of being diddled. I mean, who doesn't? When we got to my grandma's room, I told my parents everything. They were relieved that I was safe and unharmed. Case file number 721, written by Ayumi-san, 2006, a special kind of table repair service. 
Sounds silly, but this freaked me out this morning. About three years ago, my cousin who runs a resale shop posted that she had some random things for free on her porch. One of these items was a blue kid-sized fold-out table. These aren't exactly cheap and I remembered my grandma having one as the kid's table at family reunions when I was a child. Nostalgia made me feel like I should pick it up for my own kids and their cousins for when I host dinners on holidays and so on. The reason it was free was because it was a decent sized tear in the middle of the leather top. I figured I could just throw a small sheet or tablecloth on it and all would be well. I used it multiple times later, but I was continually annoyed that the ridges of the tear would make anything I placed in the middle of the table tip over or spill. While the virus was a big thing, I decided to fold up the table and store it in the garage since we likely wouldn't be having any get-togethers, not in the foreseeable future anyways. Flash forward to last night, I went to the garage to get some meat from the deep freeze and happened to see this table in the corner. I remember that I bought some fancy duct tape from Hobby Lobby that was pretty multicolored mushrooms all over it. I made a mental note to possibly repair the rip in the morning with this tape after cleaning the table up. After all, that would be less tacky than plain gray duct tape. So this morning, I told my kids I would get it ready so they could paint pictures and watch cartoons. They were pretty stoked as they thought I'd gotten rid of this table. I pull it out to the kitchen and start wiping it down get to the top, there is no tear. None. I see a small indenture that appears like a tear, but it isn't even close to the 5 inch gash size rip I remember. I asked my husband if he maybe repaired it without my knowledge, even though that would be fairly evident if he had done so. He was also slightly bewildered and said he too remembered the tear, and no, he hadn't touched the table at all. I have a picture of the table from this morning, but I unfortunately don't have one with the tear. <laughs> I know this seems really trivial, but I honestly can't make sense of the situation. Lucky me, I guess, now my family can actually use this table on the regular. I now have a Patreon. If you'd like to support the channel, please feel free. Now on to the next story. Case file number 722, written by Peace Love Kelly. A giant pile of lost objects. I have always had odd, unlikely, and even seemingly impossible things happen to me. I dare not go into all of them, as I honestly believe something is attached to me, be it an angel with a sense of humor, plain old weird karma, energy, I don't know. I don't want to upset whatever it might be. I write this with no disrespect intended. This is just to tell you about the many items that have had literally disappear, never to be seen again. Even today, every day, things are not where I leave them. I've learned I have to be very aware of where I put something. Maybe keys, glasses, my remote control. And still, when I look for it later, not only is it not where I put it, but I might find it under other things, like a shirt or piece of paper that I had not moved. That's my day to day. But I've had many items really disappear. I've only over the last couple of years become aware of the multiverse theory or given any real consideration to it. Maybe this is where they go? In the 1980s, I was going from the car to our condo with my husband and some family members. The parking spot we'd parked at was a mere 15 or so yards from our door, but at the time this happened, I'd walked at most 5 yards from the car. I took my giant wad of a keychain from the car and held it in my hand. As we all walked towards the condo, within a matter of seconds, I realized my keys were no longer in my hand. I asked everyone to stop and help me look for them. My husband had known I had my keys, so he assumed I'd dropped them somewhere. We all assumed that, although I knew it would have been impossible for me not to have heard a substantial clink if they dropped from my hand to the pavement, considering I had many keys and a lot of unnecessary metal keychains. There was only black pavement between the car and the condo, as I hadn't made it as far as a small grassy area. Everyone looked for about 20 minutes, including all through the car and the entire parking lot in grass, even though I hadn't been near the grass. Those keys never turned up. I had to have remade three car keys, house keys, mailbox key, and other random keys like those to my parents' house. None of my family would have taken my keys as a prank, never admitted to it, and let me spend all that hassle to replace everything. I couldn't replace the keychains. 
I lived there another seven years and those keys were never found, not even by my neighbors. My husband and I lived near San Francisco. The Golden Gate Bridge was celebrating an anniversary which we attended. My husband bought me a really cool t-shirt commemorating the event and I love that t-shirt. It was just the two of us. We got into the car and of course I had the shirt with me. I even opened it up and looked at it again in the car as we were driving home. It was dark by then and a little breezy so we had all the car windows rolled up. We didn't stop anywhere between the bridge and home but you know what I'm going to say. The shirt never made it to our home and I never saw that t-shirt ever again. When we got home, it was not in the car anywhere, and even checking and rechecking the car over the next couple of years, it never turned back up. This also happened with a movie rental from a video store. I'd put the VHS into the car, and by the time I got to the video store, it was gone. It was exactly the same several years later with a rented video game. Also, I had a banana disappear once from a car, but no telltale smell of old banana ever appeared, it just wasn't there. Mysteriously, these are all car related, even though they were all in different cars in over many different years. I've lost many other things that I know were in my house, that were just never located again, even after moving. Special things that I put in a special place just vanished. Of course, I've lost things that I can attribute to theft or human error but most of these can't. Are all of these many lost things in a big pile together in some other reality or dimension? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Case notes for file 722. The giant pile of lost objects. So just recently I narrated a story about someone losing uh, plenty of jewelry throughout their life. It disappeared, would reappear, and then disappear again. And I had postulated that this could be related to some sort of entity attached to them. I don't really like using the word haunting, I don't think that's descriptive. It carries too much negative connotations. It's a bit too heavy. More like a person of interest in supernatural affairs. For some reason, different people attract supernatural entities and events more than others. Kinda like a mosquito is attracted by a person's CO2 output and their pheromones, we have invisible lures, depending on what we're luring in. Be them bugs or something a bit more intense. There's just something about certain individuals that have a greater tether to out of phase beings. But about this glitch specifically, what astounds me more than anything else is the banana vanishing. Because for any other inanimate object that wouldn't degrade, at least not with an odor, you could always attribute it to somehow, unlikely, getting caught in an area that you can't access. Now that in of itself is kind of a glitch but you can sort of try to rationalize it away. But if it's something that would rot and produce unspeakable stench, well, there's no way around that. If the banana was there, and you know it was, and now it's just not, and you didn't eat it, you know, you leave a banana in a hot car and the smell is going to be a mortal threat. <laughs> You're going to need a biohazard team to deal with that. Total proof through a banana. Who would have guessed? Creepy file number 41. Written by Jedi Bo Jedi Prime 29, The Eternal Stare. I work in the public sector where basically we have books, but they're all free as long as you have a card, if you get it, and there are a lot of patrons who can be creepy. Some are disturbed or have mental issues, which is understandable as to why they are creepy, but it still doesn't help. Now, there's a guy I used to see sometimes when I'm working who just stares. He stares at people anyone really. Tonight he decided to stare at me, all shift. I only noticed a few times. This night I saw that he had left for the bus stop after we closed. I left for the grocery store, hoping to avoid him. When I arrived at the shop, he was there. Now he left early enough to get on two different buses before the one we both got on. At the stop I sat down to just chill and he paced the stop, staring at me still unblinking the whole time. I'm a pretty big guy so it takes a lot to creep me out. He accomplished this somehow in two minutes. He kept staring at me until I moved. I figured if I stood up I'd be at a better angle to defend myself. He then took my seat. See this bench has two spots. Instead of taking the unsat in, empty spot on the right, he took my exact spot and continued to stare, following me with his eyes as I kept moving around waiting for this damn bus to show. 
I, at one point, began moving back to my work for a better area. I would rather take the creepy people around there than him. Now in reality I wasn't really in immediate danger as I could easily have taken him, but I don't want to know what he could do. The LED sign of the bus crested the hill before the headlights, which gave me a sense of relief. That would be quickly diminished. Now this guy has stared at me before, but never got on the bus too. Tonight he had enough cash. This is when I knew he was following me. I began to head to the back of the bus. He still followed. I quickly changed directions and sat near the front. He weaseled his way to the front and quickly took a seat directly across from me. I know this because as I was nodding off, an intense instinct of, ha, I'm in danger, took over, and my eyes shot open. There he was, ever unblinking, ever staring, ever creepy. Now this part is what has scared me for a bit. For a week and a bit, my bus service closed some major stops without thinking how it would impact anyone. Anyways, my closer to home stop is closed so for a couple shifts I had to get off on the stop before. Complaints from the public quickly made the closer stop become available again. He must have not known this, but somehow he did know I got off at the farther stop. This stop is also super sketchy with the streetlight being covered by trees making this tiny strip of sidewalk basically blacked out for a bit. This man goes to get off at the stop before, looks behind and sees me still seated. I watch in horror as he goes to take his seat again. At that moment I took my chance and hauled ass out of that bus. He stared at me angrily through the exit door as the bus pulled away. He tried to follow me off the bus but it was too late. The road I am on is a straight road so you have a clear line of sight to the next stop. My horror intensified when he did not get off at the next stop. I haven't seen him since and I hope we never meet again. Case file number 723, written by Lady Grayzilla. My pregnant neighbor is in the same person. I'm hesitant to tell this story. No one believes it, even my husband who saw the whole thing but here we go. My neighbors directly across the street from me, they're married and expecting a baby. The wife is a tiny blonde woman, very Caucasian, very tiny build. We wave to each other daily and yell salutations across the street. She goes into labor and they leave for the hospital. A week later I see the car has returned so I bake some cookies to take over and congratulate them. Another day or two goes by and I see a thick, brunette lady outside with the baby and I wave, assuming it's a relative that's come to help with the newborn. A few more days pass and I see the husband outside with the brunette and the baby, so I take the cookies over. It's her. It's the wife? Same name, same personality, and the same demeanor, except now she's a thick, kinda tall brunette, Pacific Islander. The husband doesn't even acknowledge any difference. She talks to me and treats me the same way she always has, but it's a totally different physical person. My husband noticed as well. We even made some jokes about his wife swapping at the hospital, but since he can't wrap his brain around it, he starts to believe that she's always been this person, even though he clearly remembers her as teeny and blonde. I feel like everyone has lost their minds. It's been almost two years since that shift and she's still a thick, tall brunette. And then I feel like maybe I have lost my mind. My only consolation is that my husband remembers it too, if only vaguely. I showed the picture I found of her to my husband last night. He's a little bit of a mess about it. The man is not a conspiracy guy, at all. But he remembered her. There's no denying that. He started asking some questions and tossing around ideas about what could have happened. I convinced him to go to the church this morning and attend their service. I spoke briefly with the pastor and said my neighbor had recommended that I attend. He was grateful she was sending people his way even though, get this, she had not attended service since she had the baby. She apparently changed churches to one a little closer when she gave birth. So I don't know where to go next except for putting some feelers out in the neighborhood and finding an excuse to hang out with her. I spoke directly to my neighbor. I endured the heat all week and spent way too much on flowers to plant in an attempt to run into my neighbors. The old lady next door doesn't remember the neighbor's wife having blonde hair, but her middle-aged daughter does. She said, 
Yeah, that was a couple years ago. I don't know why she went so dark. I thought it would wash her out. When I pointed out that it wouldn't wash her out because her complexion is tan now, she looked confused and said that maybe she had been tanning because she did look darker. I pushed it a little further and asked if she also seemed taller, but she seemed stuck on the fact that the very Caucasian blonde woman had gotten tan enough for such dark hair to look natural. She gave me several reasons but didn't seem convinced either. I also spoke to the changed lady's next door neighbor and mentioned her having blonde hair before. Neither he nor his wife remember her ever being blonde. They both agreed she had dark hair even on move-in day. Yesterday, I finally cornered the changed neighbor lady outside. She pulled up with groceries and I offered to help carry them with her. I started talking about the church and how I had spoken with the pastor. She said some really nice stuff about the church, but also that she needed a church closer. That's why she switched. When I pointed out that her new church was actually further away, she said she had never actually measured it, but it seemed closer. I pointed out that her old church was in our town, and our new church is in the next town over, and she said the back roads must just make it seem shorter. Some red flags popped up here, because the back roads around here are long and windy roads that circle around our town and pass by all the farmland. It doesn't ever make things go quicker. It's a nicer drive, sure, but it always adds a good chunk of drive time. Also, the new church is in the middle of the town, two streets over from Main Street, so if you take the back roads, you actually have to circle back to get on the main roads to get onto it anyway. It would have been much more convenient to take a direct route using the town roads that connect the two towns. It's almost a straight shot from the middle of our town to the next town over. I don't know why that bothered me so much, but it did. After a little while of small talk, I brought up the hair. I said that I was trying to go blonde to hide some gray that I have coming in, and did she have any tips? She laughed and said the last time she was blonde she was in high school, and it was a mess, so she didn't recommend it. I pointed out that she was blonde right before having her baby, and she got really weird, almost defensive, and said she hadn't. She had only tried to go blonde that one time in high school and it turned orange, so she dyed it back immediately. I told her I chalked it up to pregnancy because she was definitely blonde while she was pregnant. She ended the conversation shortly after and thanked me for my help, but you could tell she was annoyed with me. So guys, not super sure what I've learned other than the girl next door to me, the old lady's daughter, and I are going to have another chat. She made me feel like she remembered, but she couldn't wrap her head around it. I'm gonna go back to the church on Sunday to poke around and talk to some other people. Maybe I can dig up some more. Case notes for file 723. My pregnant neighbor isn't the same person. So while reading this, my mind kept going towards witness protection. There was like an alarm bell going off in my head. This must be Witsec. But there are flaws with this theory. The first, of course, is I've never heard of Witsec placing a single individual into a new family or relocating a single individual and then replacing her with, what, an actor? I suppose it's not inconceivable, especially if there's a large monetary reward for the other person that's just impersonating them. It doesn't seem sustainable to me. But I suppose for a temporary small amount of time, it could be possible. But if we're talking years here, I don't know. It doesn't seem quite right, does it? There is a small thing that does support this, though. In that, when you confronted the neighbor about her having blonde hair while being pregnant, she got defensive. That seems strange. It seems something to sort of laugh at, not get defensive over. Unless you're actually guarding something very important, and the secret is getting close to being discovered because of these questions. That does lend towards the idea. Now, if it is Witzek, why do half the people you talk to, including your husband, Remember her as the old way, at least in part, maybe hair color being different, but not exactly all the details of her size and everything, skin color. But then the other half don't remember her being different at all, they always remember her being as this tall brunette. It's conceivable that this is just attributable to neighbors not really paying attention to each other anymore. I know in the past they did, but these days, I mean, I don't really notice my neighbors all that much. I couldn't tell you what they look like. So it's possible it's just absent-mindedness from the other neighbors not paying attention. Now assuming it's not Witsec, what else could it be? For the same reasons, I don't think it's quantum immortality, because people remember her, at least have to, as she was before. 
And it's not like half the neighborhood went through quantum immortality and we were transposed to the same new universe. Plus, you actually have a picture of how she was before. You have physical proof, which wouldn't move with you if you did die and go to a new universe. So that can't be it. Dare I say aliens? Somehow, for some reason, impersonating this specific lady and then trying to alter the memories of other people, but it's only halfway successful? And of course, they didn't remove the picture you had. Uh, to be fair though, I mean, as much as I like the idea of aliens, it doesn't really make any sense. What would be the motive? It's a bit of a stretch. To be honest, I'm stumped here. It's just a good story. Case file number 724, written by Alarmed Fan 4932 The Tandem Teleportation Incident my apologies if this doesn't quite make sense, but I'm freaked out and I have no idea how to explain this. My coworker and I were driving back from our dinner to the place we were staying at. We had driven this route a handful of times, and we were very familiar with the surrounding area. It was a 7 minute drive from the restaurant to where we were staying. Okay, so we left the restaurant and had a straight drive for about 2 miles. No turns until we had to take a right turn into the parking area of the property we were staying at. As we approached the hotel, the tall, Courtyard by Marriott sign was visible, as was the building. We were a block away from the turn, and then we suddenly just weren't. We were all of a sudden driving on a highway, about to take the exit on the right. It was immediately apparent and I said to my coworker, Wait, something is wrong here. And he replied, yeah, what the hell just happened? We were just about to turn into the parking area. I told them to pull over, and I looked up on maps where we were. The map showed we were 20 minutes away, in the opposite way we had come from. It was physically impossible, and the time on the clock was still the same as it was when we were next to the hotel. I don't understand, and neither does he, and he doesn't want to tell anyone because it sounds just so crazy. We genuinely teleported 20 minutes away, and it's the same time. It was the single most disorienting feeling I have ever experienced. But now, after that, I feel like everyone in my life has just changed. Everyone feels so distant. I can't shake the feeling that something is still really very off. Please help if you can. Case file number 725, written by I don't know. The second pair of perfect jeans. We all have that favorite pair of jeans. You know the one I'm talking about. They fit perfectly and are the first thing you wear after laundry day. Last time I was in Miami, I found mine. They make my butt look amazing and fit like a glove. I literally love them and hate myself for not getting two when I found them. I just got back home from a long trip and of course I wore them on my flight back. Yesterday, I did laundry and this morning I was excited to wear them. I went out to run some errands and after getting back, I was looking for something when I found a pair of jeans thrown in one of the cabinets. I thought it was weird because I remembered putting them on this morning. That's when I looked down and saw I was wearing the same pair of jeans. The weird thing is that they are identical, same brand, same size, same shade and they are even folded the same way I would. That's what freaked me out. See, I never used to fold my pants, but on this trip I found a pair of flats and decided to fold my jeans to see how they would look, and since it looked good, I just left them like that. So now, I have two pairs of my favorite jeans, and while it's still very strange, I'm not going to complain. It's just odd. Where did they come from? Creepy File Number 42 Written by Ribodat Kid, The Light Bulb Intruder Hi everyone. I've been in my family's new house alone for a few weeks now. My family moved here about three weeks ago. It's a really cool house, it's pretty spacious for where it's at. It's got cool features like super nice Wi-Fi, a pool with a slide, and a door system with a passcode lock. It's by far the coolest house I've ever lived in. Anyways, I haven't had a lot of irrational fear in my life. I believe in ghosts and spirits, but I've never had first-hand encounters with them. I think most stories people tell aren't real, and I wonder if mine even is. I don't know if it is, but I figured I would share some details. The first night I got here, I had to take a 5 hour flight, so I was pretty tired by the time I got home. When I got to the new house, I looked around for a little bit, called my dad, he told me which one was my room, and I came in and went to sleep. 
I woke up at like 3am with my door wide open and lights on all over the house that I hadn't turned on myself. I was pretty sure I had turned at least some of the lights off, so I was kind of anxious, but I also figured it could have just been my mind making it up since I was so tired. I got up, turned off the hallway light, closed the door, and turned off the light in my room. I'm gonna be honest with you, I didn't want to go all around the house because I'm kind of a wuss. The next day I had no problems, I bought a pizza and chilled out by the pool. I was loving living in this mini mansion by myself. A few more days went by and one night, I was watching Moon Knight in my living room when I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up naturally at about 2am on the recliner chair. The lights were off this time rather than on and I knew I had left them on. I sat there for a moment and then realized there was something moving in the kitchen. I watched in terror as I saw a bald man walking across the kitchen. He had an abnormally large head, almost like a light bulb with his grinning smile. The room was illuminated only by the glass screen door to the right of the kitchen. He just started walking back and forth throughout my kitchen. My heart was pounding. My phone was dead because I fell asleep and I just stared, holding my breath, holding myself completely still, doing my best to hold back my shivers. He kept walking back and forth, opening drawers. He did this for about 10 minutes until he looked over at me and then walked out of the house. When he left, I sprinted upstairs and looked outside, only to see nothing. I figured it was a dream. I went downstairs and checked the door. Yep, the automatic lock is good. There is no way anyone could have gotten in or out. At midnight, my passcode lock refuses entry, and you have to have the physical key to get in. I chalked it up to a hallucination and went to bed. The next night, I played some video games online with a buddy of mine. We were having fun until I walked down at about 11pm only to see the front door wide open. I had left earlier to go get some food but I remembered clearly closing it when I came home. I was unnerved by this but still thought not a lot of it. I went to sleep at about 11pm that night. I was sleeping normally until I woke up at 3am again to see the lights on outside my room. I swore I had turned them off. I heard footsteps outside walking up and down the hallway. I sat in horror again, lying in my bed trying not to make a noise. I had thought maybe someone had really gotten into the house when I had left the door open. However, the lights turned off and nobody left the house because I would have heard it out the window. So once again, I figured it was just my mind playing tricks on me. This brings us to last night. Well, more like this morning. Last night, I went out to get food again. When I left my house, I remembered closing the door and turning the lock on. I heard the click and I left. I ended up going to Five Guys, which, by the way, it's way too expensive for not very good food. Anyways, when I got home, I was mortified to see the door wide open. This time, I was highly scared. It couldn't be a dream. I snuck into my house, closed the door and locked it. I went into my kitchen and grabbed one of those steak carving forks as a weapon and went through my house. I checked each room, turned on all the lights and made sure no one could get out. I called my dad. No good. He didn't pick up. He is in New York so he was already asleep. I hung out and waited for a while and figured I was just crazy again. I went upstairs and after an hour on my phone, I fell asleep. This morning, I woke up in a rush and saw the man standing in my doorway staring at me. The same man as before only to sprint away when I got up to chase him. I got up and grabbed the steak fork again and ran after him down the hall for there to be nothing there. This is what prompted me to write this. I saw him in broad daylight and he responded to me following him and threatening him. I figure he is not real, something my mind is making up because I'm here alone, but has anyone had such vivid hallucinations like this? What do I do to stop having these? Also, I checked the carbon monoxide monitors and they seem fine. I replaced the batteries and everything is fine at the moment. From my understanding, it makes a beep noise when it detects a leak and it's not making anything. But I'm going to let it sit for a few hours as I leave the house. The more I think about it, the more I second guess my mental state because most of the stuff that happens happens when I leave or enter consciousness. However, the door stuff just freaks me out. I appreciate a lot of people's concerns. 
A lot of people tell me there may be something wrong with my head if I'm seeing such vivid hallucinations. You may be right and this has been kind of eye-opening to look into my mentality. For the time being, if I'm going to buy cameras, I don't think I will. I believe what is causing this man to return to my dreams and hallucinations is me believing he is real, at least to some extent. Last night, I stayed up until about 4am. Many people noted that whenever I see him, it's when I wake up. Last night, I didn't sleep, and he made no appearances. I checked the doors and the only strange occurrence of the night was that my garage door was unlocked, but that one I'm more okay with pinning on myself than some mystery squatter. Everything stayed shut all night. Case Notes for Creepy File Number 42 The Lightbulb Intruder I think there's a lot more to this than simply hallucinations or a glitched out mental state. You already checked the carbon monoxide detector, which should always be in operation and I highly recommend that everyone get one. You never know, it's an insidious killer. I do think there's more going on here than simply being crazy. You'd have to be full on schizophrenic to be hallucinating this often and in such extreme ways and also shutting on and off lights, opening doors without even realizing you're doing it. That's Tyler Durden level crazy. I don't think that's you. I mean, nothing wrong with getting checked out, but I do assume here that it's probably an entity or maybe some human intruder. But what kind of human intruder has a light bulb shaped head? Now maybe you applied that hallucination towards it? But why would he keep coming back if it's just a human being? What's the goal on that? Good question to ask. Personally, I do think it's probably some sort of entity. Maybe a trickster just trying to torment you. Given how high-tech the home is, I can't imagine anything else. If it was just a human intruder, what could their motivation be? Just to play around with you? I haven't heard of that, especially over such a long period of time. I do highly recommend that you get cameras though. I don't know how long it'll be until your family comes to join you in the house. If it continues to happen when multiple people are there, and no one is mentioning anything about you walking around sleepwalking or acting uh, differently, then I don't think it's you. I do think there's some sort of entity there. If lights start to flicker, if you feel odd in any way, then do pay attention. That said, I don't get the impression that you're in any danger, so at least there's that. Enjoy the high-tech home. 